everyone. Welcome again to our Quarantine Studio Visit Series. I'm Devanna Robity, the Program Director at the Shrinebirth Art Center. I'm joined today by a painter in Ithaca, New York, called Terry Plater. Um, welcome, Terry. Thank you so much for having us in your studio today. Hi, Devanna, good to be here. And Terry is actually an artist who was selected as part of our Emerging Artists Project with the, in partnership with the Cayuga Museum. Terry sent in a proposal for the Emerging Artist Project to have an exhibit at the Schweinfurth and the Cayuga Museum simultaneously. And her exhibit was uh, going to be titled Harriet's World. And she's currently working on um, some new work for that exhibit, which will be at some point in the future. Um, but Terry, can you tell us a little bit about the work you're, you're making for Harriet's World? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. It's going to be a combination of portraits from family photos and landscape. Part of the great um, convenience of your call uh, for these shows allowed me to not have to decide whether to do landscape, land painting, or portrait or figure paintings because I'm equally drawn to both. And so when I saw the interior photos of the Cuga Museum, it made sense to use those as a place to show paintings of family since it seems to be a small uh, former home uh, with the dark wood interior that you would expect and to use the larger venue to do landscapes or land paintings. I don't want to say landscapes in particular because I don't see them as, um, let's see, I don't mean to be pejorative here, as uh, like decorative. I, I see them as a way of depicting the environment that both my family and more specifically the people who lived at the time of the Underground Railroad would have experienced. So needless to say, they're going, they're going to have to be imagined, imaginary landscapes or some based on reality, but from today, not from the 1800s. What was really interesting about your proposal and what we all really liked about it was you were connecting um, your family portraiture and your research to you know, themes in art history and to some local history, specifically um, the Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I just, well, I love the fact, this is gonna be more talking about you guys than me. I love the fact that you have such a commitment to uh, local and regional history. And of course, I know the museum is right up the street. I've went there several times, but most recently with my niece. You know, this is a really interesting part of the country we live in for our history and for that particular history. And so, um, as I said, it was, you know, I think a lot of us as artists, sometimes we will, and probably writers too, you pitch something and part of it works or it doesn't work. But in this case, everything seemed to come together with what you were interested in and, and what I can do and what I actually want to do as my next step. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the research you're doing into your family history and how that's coming out in your paintings. Well, the first thing I'm doing is talking to my sister. She has a much better memory than I do. We found, you know, we have all these old photographs and you'll recognize one person, like the, the one that's over my shoulder is actually where I got started painting, I think you can see it, painting family photos. And um, there's one person in the photo from which that was done that I recognized my aunt. But most of the other people I don't know, my sister's only two years older than I am, our parents are not alive. So we're, we're having to scramble to try to figure out who was who and where were they. They grew up in Washington, both sides of my, uh, both sides of my family. My mother's and my father's family were in Washington and Virginia, so not deep south. And you know, we're looking at furniture and we're looking at artifacts and we're finding things in newspapers. I, I did know that our grandfather, my mother's side, was a chef for uh, on the train car for three of the president, Harding, Captain Wilson. I might not have that in the right order. So we have some photos and some uh, maps with the, the train travel, in particular the one in 1919 with Wilson. We don't have any menus, but we've got, <laughs> we've got all the stops on the train, but none of the menus. So we're you know we're doing family history, and um, the photographs are just beautiful. You know. They're old, and so the staging, the one of my maternal, my paternal grandmother that you have was obviously staged in one of those uh, 
houses where you would go get an official portrait taken. But many of the rest are in houses that I almost remember. Uh, my dad was an architect, and so we're going back and trying to find the houses that he built and photograph them. His father was a builder. It's just, it's, it's interesting. And, um, you know, especially now after the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police, it's just a time to really just think deeply about what our families have gone through. Um, I have this old book that I bought at a used bookstore called A Timeline of World History. And I've, I'm looking at everything that happened in 1870, which is the date of a photograph of Harriet Tubman that is familiar. It's the photo, photo of her standing behind, it, standing behind the chair. So I looked at 1870 to see all the things that were going on at that time, which just helped give you an interesting point of reference. Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot painted La Perla, which is a very famous painting at the Louvre during that year. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil during that year. This was 1870. Yeah. Wagner, Wagner wrote the Valkyra. Uh, the Basuto land was annexed to the Cape Colony. A lot of interesting people were born, and, and that you know I'll get to later. So I'm only at the beginning of that uh, inquiry, kind of puts the development of our entire country in, into a context, not just the particular event of the Underground Railroad and the Civil War. And then as far as educating myself outside of our family history, I'm reading uh, Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad, because uh, I figured, you know, nothing better than going to a good writer to give you good visual inspiration for, you know, what one would have seen at that time. So um, there's that. And then the last, I guess, thing for now is I'm looking at the number of painters like Winslow Homer, Frederick Law Olmsted, and Eastman Johnson, who did work around that time. Eastman Johnson has a painting called The Fugitive Slave. It's got another name as well, but that's at the Brooklyn Museum. Yeah. So there, there's, there's more going on than we thought. You know, we kind of read we reduce it to this uh, phrase, the Underground Railroad, and then we realize there's so much more to that than we, than we know. Yeah. So um, what it sounds like is like the historical research and all of the reading and the photographing of the locations and, and the furniture that you're looking at, all of those things are really part of the work in a, really not just the making of it, but the, the thoughts generating the content. Why is that so important to you? I, I, the only thing I can say is that that's me. I, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine that I would, if it were a project like this, I can't imagine, a different project, I can't imagine that I'd be going about it differently. Yeah. So I think that just comes with territory. If I'm, if I'm painting, um, like plein air painting or painting a model, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily do the same thing, but the 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 breath, B R E A D C H of your of your call, uh, kind of allows for that. It's and that's also appealing to me because I I know art painting paintings are commodities at some point, but for me it's it's hard to see it as just a commodity, even if it's a. I did a, a show on. Uh, I, I I end up going to France a lot, and I take small groups of people to paint. And, and when I do that, I can't get my own work done. So I come back and I'll do paintings from uh, intentionally bad photographs when I return. And, and even then, it's not just a painting of a scene in some part of France, but there's something more that at least I bring to it because of my experience. And maybe that's what people will take away. I, I, um, I have shown some of the family paintings before. And and usually people are quite moved, even or especially here in Ithaca, people who are not who don't share the same background as I do. So people of other ethnicities and nationalities seem to have a reaction that speaks to them and and their family histories, even down to you know my my family had that parlor. No, my family had that parlor, and these are you know Jewish folks and Italian folks, and you know everybody seems to bring something to it. 
Um, and you, you touched on it just now a little bit about like the viewer and what they get out of um, seeing this, this essentially research that the painting becomes. What are you trying to give to the viewer in that sense? Um, why do you think it's important that you situate your family in these, in these spaces? I don't know what I'm giving the viewer. I, I paint the, the painting that makes sense to me, yeah. artistically and emotionally. And I think any, every painter would probably say that. It's what comes out of them. I, I have been surprised and pleasantly surprised at the responses of people. And I, it's, I've heard it a lot. And so it's only because I've observed people's responses that I know it speaks to them in a certain way that I couldn't have predicted. This painting over my shoulder, it's pretty old, I think late 1995. And mm -hmm. I had done it as a, um, a test to see if I could, at that point, 25 years ago, right, reproduce a photograph. So I really wanted to reproduce it fairly accurately. And, and I, in my opinion at the time, failed miserably. If I if somebody hadn't gotten to me first, I would have torn it up. That's how badly I felt about it. And I won't, I won't analyze what my goals were then, whether they were right or whether they were wrong. That's simply what I was trying to do. And I didn't have the skills to do it the way I wanted. And so I, I worked around from the edges. And, I, and by the time my time period with this project was up, I hadn't painted the faces. I'm probably giving away a whole lot more than I should right now. And, um, and so the faces are just in, in, uh, implied or inferred, you know, they're just suggested. And, and having seen people look at this painting and specifically comment on the faces, um, I think that's where people project, you know, that looks, like, that looks like my grandmother or that looks like my auntie. And these are people who are not African-American and with whom I have nothing in common, but they, they, they add to the painting yeah. from their own background. And um, I don't intend to do that as some sort of a, a trope or a gimmick, for lack of a better word, with the paintings moving forward. So we'll see you know, how far I get with that representation and what response it will engender. As far as hanging them in the museum, it just seems to make sense to me you know, the paintings are old, they're wood frames, they're oval shaped, the glass is kind of hard to see through. And it just seemed to me that wherever our family paintings were hung probably looked more like the cube, the room in the cube museum. Yeah. And, right. That will, that will uh, house these guys. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a little bit earlier, like George Floyd, and, and then you, when you were talking in your answer about how, you know, the faces being blank and people of other races can see themselves in the work. Um, do you have any um, emotions or reactions or, or is this, is the current events pulling your work in any specific direction right now? Yeah, um, I mean, I always, I, I've been finding this project sort of meditative anyway, even before the incidents of the past few weeks. And uh, it's just gotten more meditative. I mean, everybody's reacting in their own way. For me, uh, um, admitting the need to be out on the streets and making our voices heard, some days, you know, the best you can do is just to sit still. And so uh, being able to sit still with the, um, with the project and with the paintings, it's like an aching kind of feeling that's both like there's a sadness and then there's a curiosity because a lot of the things that have led us up to today are things my parents went through and things their parents went through in even more specific ways. And so um, that part's a little, you know, it's hard. It's hard because there's no resolution. There's no answer. You can't talk to them. You can't let them know how you feel. You can't, you know, know that they're, on the one hand, you know, you're happy your parents are not seeing what's going on today. And on the other hand, if this is a, the question of, you know, a step in the right direction, you sort of would like them to know that. So, you know, I don't have anything profound to say. I, I have to keep the radio and the radio off a lot 
because otherwise you realize, you know, your face is wet, you didn't know you were crying, things like that. So, um, it, you know, it, it's it's a good thing to do to have to dig deep and and see what this means, and and we'll see where we are next year when the when the work is up. We talked. We've talked a lot about your landscapes, and I'm, I'm sorry. We've talked a lot about your portraits, and we haven't hit too much on the landscape works. You sort of touched on it earlier. Can you tell us a little bit more about the the background behind those pieces? The ones that uh, I showed in January and that I have on the website are all done in France. And they're all done from photos and they're all done from intentionally bad photos that I take out of train windows. And the, the format is uh, wide and, you know, two by one by two. So 24 by 48 inches to give the impression of passing through and passing through for me hap happens on several levels. Obviously I am passing through the landscape um, there is something about passage, including referring to the Underground Railroad or passing, you know, the fact that what you see is not necessarily the reality. So there's something of that implied. I end up knowing France very well, not because I'm a Francophile. I started studying French when I was 27. And, I, and at the time I was contemplating working in Africa, which I did subsequently. And I thought that with English and French, I would be able to be conversant with more people on the continent of Africa than not, assuming that I didn't know local languages and that I don't know Portuguese or Spanish. And at the time I studied a little Arabic, but not a lot. And so I started studying French as a way to help myself when I was working in various parts of Africa. And, and I had the opportunity to make a trip to France and studied there for three months. Actually, I lost a job, so I said, might as well go my late 20s. And, um, and I made very, very, very dear friends who are my friends to this day. And because of that, I feel very, I feel a closeness to the country. And of course, for art, you know, there's art, France and Italy for art of a certain time period, you, you know, you can't be worse than that. So I go there for all of the reasons one goes to France. But I'm also very aware that there are lots of problems similar to the ones we have in this country that simply aren't directed at black americans i can be very hip considered very hip when i'm there once they realize that i'm not from the french antilles um but you know it's the algerians or the west africans or, so so i look at these landscapes that are beautiful and i and i'm asking myself yeah but what's behind that landscape you know is there a camp of a poor immigrant population right behind that beautiful row of lavender or something, or who was doing the work in the fields and who was doing the work to make the perfume and who was doing the work to make the fabric, whether they be um, non-white French citizens, I'm saying this carefully because many of them are citizens, not immigrants, or French who are also impoverished and, um, you know, and struggling. So, I, you know, I haven't yet um, found a way to communicate that. Anytime I try to do something that shows a, a critical social or political problem explicitly on paper, it looks very hokey. I mean, I came through academia. I stayed in school like way too long. So my uh, inclination would be to write a paper if I'm going to try to um, make comments about a political or, or a social problem that way. And there are plenty of, of artists, Norman Lewis comes to mind, he has this beautiful abstract painting, it's in red, white, and blue, and there are white little bars, and, and those are depicting men who were hanged. And it's a beautiful piece of art in and of itself. And it, it's not uh, corny or in your face, you know, as it makes the message, I, I don't have the ability to do that. And so I will continue to figure out how I can depict this dichotomy that I see or how aesthetics and equity can coexist uh, or whether they can ever coexist. I will have to work to figure out how 
I can communicate that on paper without it looking very contrived. It's very much in my mind when I look at these beautiful images that there's a lot more to it than what you see. Mm -hmm. Your studio space, by the way, is gorgeous. I'm jealous of it. It's very full. And the, the, my studio activities have taken over pretty much the entire house. Behind me, I'm sitting in the living yeah. room. Behind me, I have a table here. Because frankly, when it gets nice out, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to be downstairs. I like to be closer to the outdoors. I sit on the front porch sometimes or the back porch and paint. The, um, the still shots I sent you, I believe I sent you stills, are of the converted bedroom above mm -hmm. me and then the video is the converted attic which is above that that's the one they're both pretty full right now i think the only place in the dining room are pretty much dedicated spaces in the bedroom but the rest the project is taking over the house and it's only going to be more of that as we get closer to showtime because of framing and all of that yeah. those obligations um, why don't we uh, cut to this video here um, that you yeah. sent me. I will. This is a short video taken in my third floor studio, a converted attic space. It's a space that allows me to do larger work and work that is less, more messy, shall we say. These are two panels that I will be using in the Harriet's World exhibit. I want to do tondos, which are round paintings of Harriet. And there's a rather ferocious looking start of a self-portrait and a study, a block in underpainting for one of the main pieces for Harriet's World. Working space, stored space. And as I proceed through this door, I will show you the other part of the studio, which is the area that allows me to store work, to also um, spray if I need to. As you can see, I have a escape ladder since I'm on the third floor of my home. Lots of storage space, decent light, do some drafting back here, storage space, work tables for framing matting and other such activities. Storage for other work I do, including sculpture, which I often use as a way to supplement my ability to compose paintings that I'm doing. Sink for cleanup. And back again into the front space. It's very nice to have this door that I can close off because I can only work with a certain amount of visual chaos. This door allows me to make sure I keep that in check. That was, that's wonderful. I, I love your space. Um, what's it like working up there? How's your, how's your process? I, I circle because I, I get what I can see consider to be the equivalent of stage fright all the time. And so I, I circle and I circle, I'll sort of sneak up on the work and you know, you arrange and you organize, you have to be careful not to let this, that uh, habit or process take too long because if you, if you aren't careful, you have done, you will have done nothing but circle and never got to the work. Yeah. So eventually, you know, I, I make my piece. I, um, I start different uh, paintings in different ways. I have the um, Bhutan sofa up there, so sometimes I'll sit and I'll read or I'll sketch. Uh, the main thing is just to, to be there, uh, not to not to judge yourself. Usually at the end of every day, I think that what I've done is a great failure, and in the morning, it's a great success, or at least it looks fine. And so absent little people getting in my studio in the middle of the night and working on it, you know, the stuff is usually quite okay. You just have to let it out and, um, and, and, um, and be at peace with the idea that it will, it will be what you need it to be. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you for, for inviting us into your home today. If you want to learn a little bit more about Terry's artwork in advance, you can check out her website. And she will also have a piece in Made New York. Um, this uh, When we open, I, I do believe it's officially in August now. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. And thank you so much for joining us, Terry. Thanks, Savannah. Be good. Stay well, stay safe.